pretty sure you have no idea where the most powerful earthquake in U.S. history took place. Everything started with tremors that had a magnitude of 9.2. They shook the land for only four minutes, but it was enough to trigger a monstrous tsunami reaching more than 8 meters in height. All this horror happened not in an earthquake-prone state like California, but in Alaska. The ruthless force of nature wiped out the entire village of Chinega. 68 people used to live there, and 23 of them died. The only reason the number of victims was relatively low is that Alaska isn't densely settled. When an equally powerful earthquake occurred in populous Japan in 2011, it took the lives of at least 20,000 people. Even though the Japanese are always on high alert and have long been prepared for earthquakes, but what if a similar disaster strikes a heavily populated region of the U.S. somewhere where it's the least expected? I'll tell you more. There are signs that it won't be long before nature launches a brutal attack. How can people survive an earthquake in that part of the U.S. where nobody's ready to face this kind of catastrophe? Two hundred years ago, something terrifying broke out from deep inside American ground. On February 28, 1812, readers of the Weekly Messenger saw a strange piece of news. The paper said that in December of the previous year, residents of the small city of New Madrid woke up from an intense shaking. Furniture was flying through the air, buildings were collapsing, and all the trees were torn up and fallen all around. People were dashing outside only to see fountains of sand emerging from under the ground wherever they looked, while horrified animals were completing this truly apocalyptic picture with their howling. On top of that, because of the earthquake, church bells that day were ringing all by themselves, and chimneys were falling down hundreds of kilometers away from New Madrid. According to modern estimates, that quake ranged in magnitude from 6.7 to more than 8. However, in the early 19th century, Washington officials didn't take this news seriously since it wasn't California, known for its seismic activity, but a region located much farther to the east, the state of Missouri, where nothing like that had ever been recorded before. And as if to put skeptics in place, nature decided to strike again. On January 23rd and February the 7th, a quake reached a magnitude of no less than 7.5, although according to other sources, it was nearly 9. This land upheaval turned some parts of the Mississippi River against themselves to flow backwards. Enormous waves washed all boats ashore, and the swampy soil was bubbling and splashing in all directions. This time, the ground vibrated all the way to Washington. Overall, the tremors could be felt across a territory occupying two and a half million square kilometers. Besides massive earthquakes, scientists detected around 2,000 smaller ones. When experts arrived at the epicenter in New Madrid, they found 40-meter craters and wells full of sand. Some of them were right under houses. But what could cause such a calamity in the Midwestern United States? And what are the chances of history repeating itself? These are not just idle questions, because compared to the early 19th century, when this region was almost uninhabited and the death toll remained unknown, today it's become a major metropolitan area, meaning that in total, 45 million people are potentially in danger. If the New Madrid disaster happens again, and right now, the tragedy of quake hit Turkey where over 50,000 people died in early 2023 will seem much less appalling than the consequences we might witness. It's not that hard to imagine the scale of damage because we already have examples of quakes hitting the western US, and this time, there's no lack of details. So how did people survive them? 
Among lots of apocalyptic earthquakes that have ever struck the American West, there's one that stands out, the deadliest one. It took place in 1906 in San Francisco. It was almost as powerful as the quake that had struck New Madrid a century earlier. A series of tremors with a magnitude of 7.9 plunged the big city into chaos, turning it into a living hell. The street asphalt buckled and piled up while the ground moved like waves in the ocean. Houses were flattened all the way to the horizon, and fires were burning for three days in a row because communications between the fire companies were cut off. Overall, 80% of San Francisco was completely destroyed. 300,000 people were left homeless. The disaster severed all telephone and telegraph lines. There was no electricity or water supply. To stop looters who were shamelessly cleaning out the city, police were granted permission to shoot them on sight. Officers didn't hesitate to do just that when they caught the criminals. Meanwhile, hospitals were overwhelmed and staff simply couldn't cope with the inflow of victims. One woman even jumped out of a fourth floor window because of the awful pain she couldn't stand any longer. According to estimates, this earthquake and its consequences claimed the lives of around 3,000 people. The San Francisco tragedy of 1906 left a lasting impression on everyone, including the authorities. So they decided to act and developed a special preparedness plan to teach people survival basics. Here are five rules that all San Franciscans know and that could save your life during an earthquake. First of all, if you happen to be inside when an earthquake starts, you've got to climb under a table or any other sturdy piece of furniture. Second, keep away from doors, windows, and any objects that can fall and break, including walls. Even if they look strong, it doesn't mean they won't collapse on you. Third, forget about elevators. You may get stuck in them or, worse, fall down from a great height. The fourth rule, stay put and wait until the shaking stops. Most of the time, people get injured when they try to find a better hiding place while newer quakes keep occurring. Finally, the fifth rule, if the disaster starts when you're outside, stay in the most open area you can find. Any buildings, trees, and power poles are your enemies. Everything that threatens to crash down will definitely do it as soon as the ground shifts. And if you happen to be near the ocean, you're in big trouble. Your only chance to escape is to climb to the highest place you see out there. Leave your car with no remorse because you'll never drive away from a possible tsunami anyway. Believe it or not, but when people follow these rules, the number of casualties is lower. There was a big earthquake in Los Angeles in 1994. It registered a magnitude of nearly seven, but took the lives of only 60 people. Besides, Californians saw a lot of disaster movies about the San Andreas Fault. Plus, thanks to numerous documentaries, everyone in the U.S. knows that the cause of earthquakes in the region is grinding between the Pacific and North American tectonic plates. The colossal fault separating them from each other stretches over 1,276 kilometers along the coast of California. Even though this area is dangerous, it's already well studied. But what about New Madrid? Of course, specialists know about that horrible catastrophe, but only a few locals have ever heard about it. Naturally, the question arises, who will make an emergency plan in case another awful quake happens? Interestingly, if you check a map of tectonic plates, you'll see that the North American plate is absolutely monolithic there. Could it be that scientists have missed fragments that grind against each other and cause tremors, especially considering that it already happened in U.S. history and did severe and extensive damage? Deep under the surface, between California and Alaska, there's a latent danger that once triggered a record disaster most people had no clue about for a pretty long time. In the 80s, geologist Brian Atwater and graduate student David Yamaguchi discovered a very strange thing near the Copalis River in the state of Washington. It was a mysterious ghost forest, a 
big grove on the northern bend in the river full of long dead cedars. The trees were leafless, branchless, even barkless. They were quite literally reduced to their trunks sticking out of the salt marsh. For a long while, experts assumed that the cedars had died because their roots had gradually disappeared into the salty waters. However, Atwater performed a more detailed analysis, and in 1987, he made a discovery that came as a shock to all of his colleagues. The ghost forest was a victim of a horrible cataclysm. The soil layers looked like the entire riverbank had suddenly plummeted, which was exactly why the trees sank into the salt marsh. This was what Yamaguchi concluded after studying growth ring patterns in the dead cedars. It turned out that the ghost forest stopped growing in 1699, meaning that in the winter of 1700, the grove was suddenly flooded with seawater. Taking into account the terrain, researchers understood that only a tsunami could be behind this, and it had to be at least 15 meters high. The water slammed into the coast with force enough to compress the soil and basically bury the tree roots. Scientists now believe the devastating wave followed the unprecedented Cascadia earthquake in 1700. The point is that this northwest region of the United States is located in the Cascadia subduction zone. This fault zone lies north of San Andreas and extends over 960 kilometers along the west coast. Curiously enough, apart from two tectonic plates like those forming the San Andreas Fault, there's also a third active microplate named the Juan de Fuca. It's lurking there below the ground, and it wasn't known to science before. It sort of dives under the North American plate into the magma, and this grinding leads to magnitude 9 or 10 earthquakes. One of them happened back then in 1700, but experts cracked the old Cascadia mystery only 45 years ago. These days, modern technologies predict that a series of major quakes are very likely to hit this area again. Diego Melgar, a seismologist from the University of Oregon, thinks that judging by patterns of seismic activity, the Cascadia disaster may recur in the upcoming years. But are local authorities and regular people ready for that? In the Pacific Northwest, learning about an impending catastrophe in advance is possible only if you have a special app installed on your phone. But even if you get a notification, it'll be extremely hard to resist panic when nature shows its true strength. Everything will start with high-frequency compressional waves. Dogs will sense them and start howling with fear, while people will feel the first small tremors under their feet. Then the ground will slightly move under the low-frequency surface waves, and only after that will have to deal with the main blow. Before it comes, there'll be just about five minutes to find shelter. But if it's the middle of the night, it'll be pitch dark, so you'll be able to narrowly escape only if you bother to search for an earthquake-proof building beforehand. And I'm afraid that's not going to be an easy task, since 75% of constructions in Oregon and Washington were built without such catastrophes in mind. Therefore, many houses will slip off their foundations and slide along the shaky ground, getting ruined in the process. If there are heavy objects not fixed to the floor or walls, they'll be somersaulting through the rooms and injuring people inside. Eventually, around a million buildings will become piles of rubble, and most roads and bridges will be damaged beyond recognition. Not to mention train tracks and airport runways. Police stations and hospitals won't survive either, so waiting for help will be pointless, especially since they'll be round two a tsunami. You'll stand a chance to get through only if the moment the shaking stops, you start sprinting away from the ocean without looking back. But even if everyone tries to follow the safety rules, the Cascadia earthquake will be so large and terrible that it'll result in numerous victims anyway. According to the most optimistic forecasts, 13,000 people will die and 27,000 will be badly injured. 
in the case where the Cascadia disaster occurs in summer and beaches are chock full of vacationers, it's safe to say that we can double or even triple these numbers. So take my advice, before taking a walk along the ocean's edge, you better check the latest seismic news. And if you live not far away from fault lines, start hoarding the biggest screws on the market and fix all your furniture to the floors and appliances to the furniture, just in case. In the meantime, a scientific search for active plates hidden under New Madrid has given unexpected results. Radar data have revealed that the North American plate is indeed composed of smaller ones, but they've been passive for millions of years. In other words, the terrible quakes in the Midwestern United States are certainly not caused by grinding in the bowels of the Earth. At the same time, studies dedicated to older layers prove that the series of apocalyptic tremors in the region take place once every two or three hundred years. This means the mysterious force of nature may attack again even right at this moment. And if it has accumulated more energy than the previous time, we won't have to rely on the media or social networks to learn about that. Moving across adjacent tectonic plates, the tremors will need a few minutes to reach even New York. But what if we don't understand the reasons behind the quakes in the eastern U.S. only because they're unique to this specific area? Therefore, to find the truth, we'll have to zoom out and see a wider picture. In world history, there are cases when earthquakes happened in regions with no tectonic boundaries. The plates were far away from each other, and yet whole cities disappeared into the ground. In 1556, the deadliest quake ever recorded devastated China. It affected 97 provinces, and its epicenter was in the Weihe River Valley, where the landscape was disfigured by 20-meter holes. The rivers reversed direction of their flow, and the mountains crumbled and fell. But the scariest thing was that dozens of houses began sinking into the ground together with people inside. It was later revealed that one Buddhist monastery had sagged by two meters. Overall, underground tremors in the region continued for six months and killed 830,000 people. Just think about this staggering number. The Jiajing Great Earthquake wiped out almost two hundredths of a percent of the then global population. The outcome was so apocalyptic that it may seem the chroniclers exaggerated the whole situation, but no, scientists confirmed this information. And yet, the mysterious force wasn't done torturing the planet. In 2018, a dreadful magnitude 7.5 earthquake struck Indonesia and snowballed into a tsunami. People did their best to escape, but it turned out the ground couldn't hold them anymore. It seemed that the soil became almost liquid and was rising and falling like waves. As a result, around 1,700 houses sunk underground like in some horror film. Nature had abnormal temper tantrums like this in many other places too. India, Jamaica, and even Madrid, the one in Spain. During the excavations conducted a few kilometers away from the city, archaeologists found the ruins of an abandoned ancient Roman town that had evidently been hit by a massive earthquake that made whole buildings sink. There had also been sand craters up to two meters in diameter, and the houses fell right into them. Wait a minute, the very same craters were discovered in New Madrid, only 20 times bigger, right? This exact detail became a clue that led scientists to a conclusion that at least partly explains what could have caused the earthquake in the Midwestern US. It was determined that even though there were no fault lines underneath some of the devastated regions, there were thick layers of sandy soil instead. So the wells found near Madrid and in New Madrid were actually traces of sand geysers. They occur when groundwater pressure at great depths increases to the point of spewing sand out of the ground. That's a very bad sign. It means that the entire Midwest is standing on sand that can suddenly sag without any plate grinding involved. And this mind-blowing shift under the surface may be strong enough to produce a series of quakes. If it happens today, say in Memphis, inhabited by over a million people and full of skyscrapers with up to 37 stories, it'll be a truly 
catastrophic event. The city stands right on the sand and groundwaters with no solid rock serving as a support. That's why if this mass gets shaken, the wet sand will settle down and the whole city will literally get sucked underground. It's useless to strengthen the foundations with screws, bolts, or even piling here. And if you somehow manage to run outside, you'll be greeted by sand geysers and quicksand craters. And that's just in Memphis. Magnitude 7.5 quakes will also make skyscrapers sink in St. Louis, Memphis, Nashville, Indianapolis, Kansas City, and Cincinnati. If tremors reach magnitude 8, we'll have to say goodbye to Minneapolis, Detroit, and Dallas. This will be calamitous, not only for the most dangerous zone, but will affect the entire country. The tremors will destroy highways and burst oil and gas pipelines. Furthermore, as the vibrations spread along the North American plate, they'll make some skyscrapers sway even in New York, Boston, and Washington. Given this disaster's uniqueness, the earthquake safety precautions designed in San Francisco won't come in handy, as the catastrophe might then recur in just a month. In the end, a new version of the New Madrid earthquake may cost the lives of around a million people. And this will make it worse than the deadliest and the most devastating quake in human history, the one that happened in China. If expert assumptions about the reasons behind the New Madrid tragedy are true, according to the most conservative forecasts, by 2050, the probability of a magnitude 6 earthquake in the region will increase to 40%. The worst part is that even being well informed about the threat, we do nothing and keep silently waiting. It's high time to take measures, which needs to be done quickly. Otherwise, half of the country will lie in ruins amid giant craters. It looks like the only reliable solution to survive anyone can count on right now is to move to a safer place within the U.S. The first location that comes to mind is Maine, where no earthquakes have ever happened and where vibrations coming from the Midwest won't reach. By and large, it seems that nothing and nobody disturbs the peace of this state at all, except Stephen King, who uses it as the backdrop for most of his books. Well, it does look perfect if you write horror stories. Vast empty spaces, cold winters in the mountains, and hardly any leisure options besides fishing or picking blueberries. There still is an alternative, though. If you feel like basking in the sun, go to Florida. Quakes haven't bothered it either, so you can find a good spot and relax on the beach. Unless tornadoes and meth gators spoil the mood, of course. Are they more dangerous than earthquakes, I wonder? Comment below and share your survival plans.